Yep, so this is work I've been doing at Imperial College uh, with uh, Colin Cotter and Abdul Aziz. Uh, so we're working on parallel in time methods. Uh, I'm looking at atmospheric models. Abdul Aziz is working at sedimentary models for the ocean floor. Uh, and I'm going to be talking particularly about the library that we're writing. So I'll go through the paradigmatic method, which is the parallel in time method we're using, uh, how we need to adapt it for non-linear problems. Then we'll talk about the software askew and do some examples. So we're looking at time-dependent uh, PDEs. So we already have a spatial discretization. So we assume we're finite elements with a mass matrix. And we want to uh, time-step this problem out to some given end time. So we discretize with the implicit theta method. Paradigm is specific to this. It's just the one that we've implemented. Uh, so if the theta is zero, we get uh, forward Euler. One, we get backwards Euler, and we have trapezium method with 0.5. And we end up with this implicit problem at each time step to go from un to un plus one. So usually we'll do this serially, one time step at a time. Uh, but if we want to get our answer particularly quickly, then sometimes this is, isn't fast enough. So we're going to try and solve for multiple time steps all at once, because more degrees of freedom, we can throw more processes at it. So here we're solving for four time steps at once, and we concatenate and we form this matrix vector equation. So you can see that each row of this matrix is the equation for a single time step. So you have uh, u3 minus u2, and then you have the, the spatial terms. Uh, this is a block lower triangular matrix. So lower triangular matrix, we could use uh, forward substitution. But this is inherently serial, so serial time stepping is just solving this matrix with forward substitution. So instead, what we do, uh, so this matrix and it's a chronic product of uh, our spatial matrices and these time stepping matrices B. So instead, we precondition the matrix with this one, where we have this tail term coupling the, uh, the first and the last time step. And the reason we do this is because these two matrices C1 and C2 are simultaneously diagonalizable with the FFT. So this means that if we do an FFT in time at every spatial degree of freedom, what we end up with is a block diagonal matrix. Essentially, we have one block for each frequency. It's block diagonal, so we can solve for each matrix independently with a different group of processes, and that's where our parallelism comes from. And in practice, alpha can be very, very small. So we get a precondition of very close to our original problem. So we have some previous results for this. Uh, so we have this convergence bound, which for small alpha is very, very good. Uh, for linear problems, we can converge in three GMO situations. And importantly, both of these are independent of the number of time steps we're solving for, which gives us some quite nice scaling for linear problems. So I said that's all for linear problems. All the interesting ones are non-linear. Sorry to anyone who worked on Helmholtz. So for the non-linear problem, uh, we now have a system that looks like this. Uh, if these spatial terms are no longer a chronic product, we have to have a different spatial residual at each time step. Which means if we look at the Jacobian of that term, the Jacobian is different in every column. So if we add on this tail term, this is no longer a circulant matrix. And the fact it's circulant means we can block diagonalize, because each column is not just a rotation of, of the previous column. So to make it circulant, we need to linearize the Jacobian at each time step around a constant term. So we have U star, which is, can be varying in space, as long as it's constant in time. So usually this is the time average, but it doesn't have to be. It just has to be constant in time. So if we make this approximation, we can then form our block diagonalizable preconditioner. So for non-linear problems, we have both the circulant approximation and this time average approximation. And we can put it into a, a chronic product form. So for non-linear problems, uh, we have several components that we need uh, when we're going to implement this. We need a way of representing a time series uh, the data structure, we need a way of forming, of representing a finite element form over that entire time series. We need uh, to represent the Jacobian 
of that form to be able to do our Krylov method, and we need the preconditioner. So this is the components that we need in our library. So a SKU is implementing these methods using FireDrake. Uh, so we're aiming to be general to any UFL PDE. We haven't found one that will break yet. Uh, oh no, UFL changed how they do split. So you can't do vector valued elements that aren't in a mixed space. Sorry, blame UFL. <laughs> this was a bit ago, there is an issue. Uh, we provide a variety of different methods and we're both space and time parallel. We get space for free because of FireDrake, thank you. Uh, and we're trying to be flexible enough to be a sandbox, but performant enough to be able to run real cases. So in the same kind of vein as, as, as FireDrake. So we're built from uh, the ensemble parallelism. So here each blue is a communicator exactly like you'd normally use in FireDrake. So the communicator you give to a mesh. So here we have, uh, say we'd have a couple of time steps on this communicator, and then the way we get the parallelism is that we have another communicator, we uh, duplicate it, and we have another couple of time steps on here, again and again and again. And what the ensemble does is it gives us these grey communicators, uh, which go in the time direction. So we have each spatial communicator we can solve a problem on, and then we have the communications in time. That one. <laughs> Thanks. It meant I didn't have to. <laughs> uh, so I'll quickly go through how we'd set up a problem in a SKU. Uh, hopefully it'll feel fairly familiar. So we set up a partition, uh, and here we have yeah, we have four ensemble ranks, and we have two time steps on each. So we create our ensemble, and then we have some classic fire drake, we have a mesh, we have a function space for a single time step, we have some initial conditions. And we give these to an all at once function, which is our representation of a whole time series. Uh, and we assign the initial conditions, so we have our initial guess. Then we have to make a form over this time series. So we give a way of creating a mass matrix and a stiffness matrix. So here we're just solving the heat equation with some boundary conditions. Again, we just give it all to all at once form, and that forms inside, it forms the finite element form across this ensemble at every time step. Then of course we have a need a solver, so we, the solver <coughs> solves the form over a function with some PETSI parameters, uh, and we have what will look like a kind of classic time stepping loop where we have solver.solve, and then we take the last time step of the previous window, and we use it as the initial guess for the next window, so we keep on solving for multiple time steps at once, forward in time. So, hopefully you feel somewhat familiar, you set up a mesh, you create a function, you make a form over the function, and then the solver on the form. Uh, and it wouldn't be complete without some PETSI parameters. So, uh, everything is implemented matrix-free, so here we're doing a matrix-free, and we're using gem rows, gem rows to solve that giant matrix vector equation. A SKU provides the preconditioner, uh, and we can set various things, so the alpha parameter, how we solve each block in this block diagonalizable matrix, which is another PETSI parameter set. And then we can uh, we provide a variety of different options for what to linearize around, which form we're linearizing, because they can be different uh, to the one you're solving. Uh, so the way that, uh, just a little bit about the way that we implement it internally within the ensemble. Uh, so taking this example where we have four ensemble ranks and two time steps on each rank, everything to the right of this dashed line is user land, everything to the left is a, is a skew. So if I'm a user, I either want to see just the entire all at once function and none of the implementation details, or I want to be able to see it as a set of individual time steps. So we provide some methods to be able to pull out kind of individual time steps or set individual time steps without knowing anything about the internals. Internally, what we do is we represent each slice, so each uh, the time steps on each ensemble, with a mixed function. Because then on each slice, we can just use kind of standard FireDrake UFL to write the all at once system for each slice individually and each form individually, and then we can use the derivative on it on, it, on every uh, ensemble rank. But then we need to make a solver on the entire system, so on the global com. 
So what we do is we create a Pepsi SNES on the global com, and we construct the vectors by taking out the Pepsi vec for each mixed function and creating the Pepsi vec with these. So it's great with array, and we literally just use the same buffers that we use for the mixed functions in the in the uh, in the Pepsi SNES, which I think is an idea for what will happen with Firedrake at some point, right? You want to eliminate the copies into the... Oh, okay, so Jack will do it. <laughs> um, but doing it like this means that on each slice we can just use standard kind of Firedrake things for uh, constructing the forms and the Jacobians and then e each time we go to the solver we just copy things into its own spot in the global Pepsi vector. Um, okay, so a couple of examples. Uh, so I've been working on atmospheric models, so I've been doing a lot with the shallow water equations. Uh, so I'm going to show some speed up results uh, where we're solving uh, the shallow water equations with a uh, Newton Krylov method. Uh, and then each block solve is a, a Gemeres with a kind of multi grid relaxation uh, on, each, on each block. So we've got the Galevsky test case, which is a classic uh, test case for shallow water equations, uh, and you get an unstable jet that then develops, uh, and you end up after, I think this is after 10 days, you end up with some vortices, so it's quite non-linear, which means it's a good test of the non-linear methods. So for strong scaling in time, uh, if we run out, so if you run this test out to 10 days, and this is for three different mesh refinements, so we have coarse, medium, and quite fine mesh. Uh, and we have the time taken to run out to 10 days. So the label is the number of time steps we're solving at any one time. So the one is the time taken for the serial method. The two is how long it takes when you're solving for two time steps at a time, then the next two steps, and the next two steps, and so on. Uh, so you can see that for all mesh refinements, actually, we get the best speed up when we're solving about 16 time steps at a time. So we get about a speed up of five times in addition to the speed up in the spatial parallelism. So if you'll see for the finer meshes, our serial method is already parallel, and then we're increasing the parallelism on top of that. Uh, so as we increase the parallelism with more time steps, we get this speed up, up to around five, uh, and then it starts to slow down again when we get to about 32 and that's a variety of the parallelism isn't optimized yet, and also uh, you just get more nonlinearity in your window, uh, which is something that we're trying to work on the nonlinear solvers. Uh, and the one that uh, Abdul Aziz has been working on uh, is a nonlinear stratigraphic model. So, this is a model for the growth and evolution of seabed. So, you get uh, things falling down from the sea onto the seabed. So the seabed grows, and this is the source term, and then you have like a non-linear diffusion uh, as this seabed um, spreads out and evolves. And it's, it's I haven't actually shown, but the, this diffusion coefficient is very, very non-linear. It's not a nice equation to, to solve. D depends on X. D um, And this is over geological time scales. The reason why we're interested in parallel in time for this application is because literally geolo geological time scales are going over kind of half a million years or so. So this time we're going to look at uh, solving out to half a million years, but solving always 32 time steps at a time versus the serial method, but changing the delta t. And we can see that if we're interested in quite an accurate solution, so quite a fine delta t. Oh, this is the one I was trying to correct before because uh, there'd been a typo in the data that, in the, the stuff that Abdul Aziz had sent. So this is meant to be 6428, 256, and then this should be pushed into 512. Is it, is it 64 days, Abdul Aziz? What is the unit of Years. Yes. Right. Yeah, so we go out to. Geology, you have big time steps. Big time steps, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So, ah, yeah, 
so we can see that uh, in the same way that for the Galevsky test case, when you have a lot of time steps in the window, uh, it gets much harder to solve. Here you're keeping the time steps fixed, but as you increase the delta t, you cover more physical time. So you still have a lot, lot of non-linearity in your window, and again, it gets harder to solve. But if you're after quite an accurate solution, so quite a small delta t, uh, for this case, we have speed ups of around four times. So, to conclude, uh, we expose more parallelism by solving a whole time series at once. We exploit this parallelism with a block diagonalizable preconditioner. Uh, we can get speed ups uh, on both hyperbolic and parabolic problems. That's important because a lot of parallel and time methods struggle with hyperbolic problems. Uh, large uh, time windows are challenging, either for large number of time steps or large delta t. Uh, we have an open source general purpose library, uh, so if anyone wants to try out parallel and time methods, that would be great, come and speak to us. Uh, and the to-do list, uh, improving this non-linear solve, uh, better preconditioning for the block solves, which also gets harder at the longer windows, uh, and then trying other problems, different applications, so Hiroe, I think we'll talk on averaging, which we're uh, interested in seeing if we can use this for the averaging as well. Uh, and implementation improvements with the parallel, uh, parallel implementation. So, thanks for your attention. Uh, so, in your results that you're showing, uh, what preconditions do you use? Uh, for the all at once system or for the blocks? Sorry, for the, the shallow weather. Uh, so we use. There we go. So for the for the whole all at once system, we use this block diagonalizable preconditioner, and for each block, you end up solving for a frequency. So it looks very very similar to the original time stepping problem, and we use a uh, multi grid with a Vanka patch smoother. Um, for your scaling results for the shallow water equations, yeah. you kind of explained the, the 32 point, uh -huh. but what about the two? Why, is, why does taking two time sets at once not really improve things when four does? There's just not enough parallelism. <clears throat> There's certain overheads uh, to it, both algorithmically and just in terms of the implementation. Uh, so you end up taking kind of as many iterations of the all at once system to solve it as you would do Newton iterations of the serial and time method. Yes. So you're just doing more work for this okay. the same speed. Sure. Whereas once you get further, there's there's the number of time steps you're solving for grows more sl faster than the number of iterations it takes. It's kind of completely <clears throat> consistent with the speed up you're getting, right? Because if you're getting uh, say a factor of five speed up up to sixteen. Basically, you're uh, two and a bit below, factor two and a bit below optimal. That's really consistent because if you look at where the 84 lines and the two lines are. So basically, you're, you, what, what this looks like is you're taking a factor of a bit more than two hit just for switching on the barrier yeah. button. Yeah. Yeah. And then once, but once you've done that, you get to you know, win yeah. back the. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And then our, yeah. The blocks are actually complex valued, so the number of processes we use is the number of time steps times two. So the efficiency is down at around 15 to 20 percent in the time parallelism, which is kind of comparable to other time parallel methods, but we're doing it on hyperbolic problems, uh, which has been, yeah, there's been less success previously. So in the strong scaling and time graphs, um, I'm a little bit confused about the number of independent variables here. So I know that you're checking, are you varying both number of time steps done at once and number of processes together? Is there some rule for that? Yes, there's a bit of a, so if, so it's about what you call weak and strong. So if I'm a parallel programmer, I say it's weak scaling if I keep the number of degrees of freedom per core the same. 
in which case that's what this is. But if I'm an applications person, then I go, strong scaling is getting the same result faster. Because can you not so have done, done the greatest training the same as you've done four times the course going from one to two? Yes, so the, uh, this is what I mean. It's solving the same time series on the same mesh. So you're getting the same answer, but you're throwing more cores at it, so you get the same answer faster, which is why I call it strong scaling. But like, how do you decide if how we're many looking, cores to throw at it? Yep. Yeah. If we're looking at uh, how we actually scale in practice, we solve more time steps at once. So if I double the number of time steps, I'm going to double the number of cores. So the degrees of freedom per core stays the same. But that's not the case for the one to So I think maybe the thing is confusing is that so we're always solving to the end the same simulation time. So if we do a small number of time steps, it just means we have to then iterate that whole thing over and over. So, uh, so yes. That makes sense. Okay. So, so, so you do, you, so the end, well, once you converge the paradigm, you copy the end values at the beginning and then you do paradigm again. So to, to, yeah. to clarify, the, these are the window lengths, they're not the length of the simulation. Yeah, we're all, always solving to 10 days. Exactly. But yeah, with this, we solve for two time steps at a time and we repeat out to 10 days yeah. and then four time steps at a time. The number of time steps per core is still not the same number of steps between one and two is the same number of one and one. Why do you have four times the process between one and two? Because the blocks on, in our preconditioner are complex valued. Right. But all the other ones are So. Yeah. To get from one to two, you need four times as many processes because you have two time steps, and each time step has twice the number of degrees of freedom because it's complex. Uh, yeah, but then, you but then to get from two to four, like so you've, you've already done that. Yeah, because you're, 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 yeah, yeah. you're still just talking about complex, right? Not turning on, not turning on, or anything. Yeah, yeah. Okay. If you wanted to look better, but be more, more dishonest, you could do paradigm or one, and then that would get a plot that would be on that straight. So yeah, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you'd then be hitting. First, first of all, parallel scaling, right? Make sure that you're uh, get um, scaling implementation to rubbish. Yeah. Um, <laughs> very good question. What are the three lines? I missed this. Oh, sorry. This is a coarse mesh. So this is a mesh of about fifty thousand degrees of freedom. This is about two hundred thousand degrees of freedom, and this is eight hundred thousand. So yes. Yeah. Yeah. A fixed mesh size. Yeah. So Josh has managed to land uh, my next public service announcement, which is um, the preferred generic citation for FireDeck has changed. There is a citation that Rathke read L16 in this paper. Yes. Yeah. Um, please cite the FireDeck manual because if you cite um, Rathke L uh, 2016, you don't give credit to anyone who's worked on FireDeck in the last eight years. <laughs> I've had the rest. I've had that reference. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> Alright, uh, let's thank uh, Shogun.